that PHA is now becoming this other agency. How are we allowing that while people are homeless or being shuffled around? So I want to make sure that I'm clear on that point that it's PHA, the housing agency, that's imploding all these buildings. And every time they implode one, most recently Bloomberg, Norman Bloomberg, they never put back the number of units that they tear down. They only put back 57 units. And then you have all this land. So I want to put it on the agency where it belongs. And low income housing should be PHA. But we have allowed them to do everything else but that. Uh, I'm mindful of the time, so we, we have five more minutes for this. So, and that's total, it's not five minutes each. <laughs> All right, so I, I, I'll, I'll try to give some, some quick stuff. Um, I think, so the question is to you know, change is your goal. Um, there's this need that we have to be self empowered. And I say that because this is not a new story. This is, this is a long, multi-generational, centuries-long story, particularly for African-Americans in this country. So when we're, when we're looking at this, I'll, I'll share real quick uh, a story about Tuskegee University. It's where I went, had an opportunity to teach, and the story is really paramount to what we're talking about here. It didn't happen because somebody said, oh, I can't wait for black folks to learn something, you know, learn. That's not the truth. And when, you, when you look at Tuskegee in any space that we have, it's only there because we were bucking the system. We were saying, listen, give me some, if you're going to give me some rotten lemons, I'm still going to turn it into lemonade. You know, so, you know, like, Tuskegee's not here because they gave us land or happy to give it to us. They gave us land because they said it wasn't buildable. And so, Booker well, T. Washington said, okay, well, you gave me some land. What can I do with it? I think, you know, it's clay and you can't build on clay, but, you know, I've heard you can make bricks, and so he made bricks. And then those bricks were turned into buildings and said we need instructors, so we hired instructors to teach people how to build buildings. And that's how you got the institution. But it wasn't there because somebody said, I really want it here. It was there because of our own self-empowerment. And so when I look at the challenges that we've been facing, I believe that the, the solutions do have to come from within. Because if we continue to blame somebody else, then that person can continue to blame us and say, well, look, you're not doing it. It's very, very difficult for you to say something to me if I'm able to take a space that I'm living in, whether it's a vacant spot or a great spot. If I can turn that into something profitable, then I don't care if you take me from this space and put me in another space, I'm going to do the exact same thing. So real quick, when I think about some of the challenges, this thing is very systemic. This is the experiences that you're having, they're there for a purpose. If we look at the conditions that folks are living in in North Philly, we were put in North Philly. We were put in Brooklyn. We were put in Harlem. We were put in Newark. And white folks moved out. Redlining is real. Redlining was a, was a condition that said, if you lived in an area that was red, and those are areas that were black areas, there is no home that's coming there. So what does that mean? If I have a business, that business is gonna move because that business can't stay there because they're not gonna get any kind of loans from the banks. And that means if I'm a homeowner, if I can move, I'm gonna move because I'm not gonna get a loan from the bank. So if I, can, don't, if I can't get a loan, then that means I have to stay. And that means that I can't contribute because there's no economy. I can't contribute to the tax base, which means I can't support the educational system. I can't support the roads. I can't support any other infrastructure. And so as an individual living in that space, when you look 20, 30 years down the line, and I don't have the skill sets that are necessary in order to be a, uh, a, a properly functioning member of society, because I haven't received those skills, that is by design. So I think that the way that we can begin to combat that is that we have to re-educate ourselves and how to use this, you know, these, these, these fingers that we have and, you know, pull up, you know, his hands and start figuring out ways to build within the spaces that are ours. And then, you know, at least then we can start to say, you know, I realize that you're giving me right lemons, but I'm going to make the lemonade. Okay. Uh, Jayla, did you want to say something? And then we'll go to Chris. Yeah, yeah. Um, to comment on what Ms. Judith said of how, how they made another unit of PJ. They, it's PJ, I can see. Like, I see where I live at, it's like, it's PHA. We all get the same amount of money. 
but it's also people that live in PJ that get a whole bunch of money and act like they're poor or don't have enough money for anything and get treated different from what we get treated. People with money get treated different than people without money. I think that's a, that's your opening for this. <laughs> Yeah, hashtag capitalism. <laughs> um, uh, I, th I think that in terms of solutions, um, and also to sort of like clarify slash add on to what I was saying before, um, while I do think that you know what's happening with here in North Philly and Philly in general with gentrification is connected to all of those other things <laughs> because all of those things are connected to capitalism. Um, I 100% agree that, you know, like, here and now, we're talking about housing and gentrification here and now. Um, and, like, my biggest disappointment is honestly that people who care about literally anything else that's affected by capitalism isn't here. Um, because, you know, people come out to something for, um, you know, for immigrant struggles and environmental struggles and standing around and things like that. And they should also be here. Um, and I think that's the case because, you know, once you accept the idea that, well, all of these things are connected to um, symptoms of capitalism, that means in my specific unique situation, I can look at other places and find examples of what to do right. Um, when you look at what the Black Panthers did when they looked to, they literally looked at China, they looked to Mao, and they said, um, well, how is it that y'all, um, you know, combated capitalism and how does that work for your people? Um, and then they come back and they start the free breakfast program and they start, um, you know, programs for like teaching and education and educating youth um, that apparently ended up being labeled as like one of the most threatening programs to the U.S. government. Um, and it's threatening because the U.S. government is dependent on capitalism and it doesn't serve people, especially black people. Um, so if we want to look to solutions to the problems that are caused by capitalism, um, I think we can look to countries that don't abide by capitalism. Um, we can look to Cuba for examples of like how to, when we want to think of, you know, like, well, obviously we want to, um, you know, PHA doesn't, isn't working and um, gentrification obviously isn't working for us. So like, we need to do something for ourselves. We have to figure out what do we want to do for ourselves. And I think a lot of the times people assume we need our own capitalism, um, and that generally doesn't pan out that well. Um, but if you look at examples of people saying, we need our own socialism, um, those solutions um, tend to work out a lot better. And in fact, the only thing that actually ends up getting in the way of those solutions working is the US government itself, which kind of shows if you like, you know, if the people who have been putting you down for so long are literally, literally the only things that is wrong with this plan, it seems like it's a pretty good plan. It's like, the worst part about the plan is that it's working well, and the people who have been putting you down feel threatened by it. That seems like a pretty good plan. So I think looking to um, a lot of the Surf the People programs that the Black Panthers have introduced, um, and looking to the programs that Cuba has introduced for its country um, and its people uh, are definitely like, sort of directions that we could go in terms of looking for solutions. Um, and I think, you know, not everything just like instantly transfers and applies. There are going to be things where, like, you know, this is Philly. This doesn't work. It's like, you know, um, I don't, I can't really think of something off the top of my head, but you know, like, so, like some stuff is not going to work. Like, you know, maybe like too many people in Philly love cheesesteak too much to be like, well, we need to have a vegan community as a part of our socialist community. Like, you know, some communities want to be vegan. Maybe Philly doesn't want to be vegan right now. Like, I think, you know, it's like not everything's just gonna like instantly translate, but I think, you know, um, it is worth looking into other people and other solutions and pulling that into this unique situation. Uh, Judith, I'm gonna have to right. ask you. Yeah, we're going to, no, no, we're going to ask um, if, if one of the young people have any final comments, then we're gonna take questions and then we can, we'll probably get your point in. Okay. Thank you okay. very much for that answer. You have anything else that you want to say? All right. So, Judith, go ahead and just you can let, let, me, let me say this because you talked about the Black Panther. Well, we got to go all the way back to Garvey. Garveyism, self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency. 
It wasn't coming out of your house saying you were hungry because we did self-sufficiency prior to the 60s. In the 50s and the 40s, there's a great book out by Julianne Mavo talking about economic development, 365 things that African Americans did on an economic basis to show that we were self-sufficient. I am a fighter for self-sufficiency. And my mother wasn't rich, believe me, she knew how to negotiate with those red liners. They were still in our communities at that time, and she was able to go and get loans to put new windows in her house, new doors, fix up the whole infrastructure of her house. So she was able to now pass that house along as inheritance to the next generation, where my family still lives now. So I want to make sure that we're clear on the fact that African Americans, still we rise. No matter what has happened to us in this country and around the world, still we rise. I'm going to put the on Join me in thanking our panelists for And of course, once again, I'm being very mindful of the time, but I do want to hear your voices, so we're just going to ask you to, to speak succinctly, right? And if you have a question for a particular panelist, to, just to identify who that is. PJ has the microphone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charlotte. I've lived in the 1921 my whole life. Um, I also work in Philadelphia, Philadelphia's outreach with the homeless population. Every quarter, every four to three months, we do outreach uh, camp with homeless people in the city. We have an influx of young homeless people in the city of Philadelphia. We also have a lot of infrastructure, as I'm sorry, Ms. Judith expressed, that is unused. We have houses, fully functional houses down at the Naval Base that are not being used. But you do have people there that are technically squatting, being able to survive. But these houses are fully functional, gas, water, electric, everything, but no one's living in them. They haven't lived in them since the naval yard closed. And there are so many houses in North Philadelphia with the land bank that are not being used. The city's felon itself, even though we can advocate for all these things, like you said, it starts with us, the people that vote. It starts with voting, getting out and voting. Some parts of North Philadelphia do not do that. Or we only go with who's shining up that day and getting us going and wrapped up. So we had to do better as a people in this community as well. Hello, uh, my name is Izzy Jackson. I'm here because I go to um, Epiphany Fellowship Church at 17th and Diamond. I also attended Temple. I lived at 18th and Tuscarana. And when I went to Temple, I was just so consumed with like trying to get by in school. I wasn't thinking about larger issues affecting the community. And I just want to say thank you so much to Jalen and Isaiah for sharing. I you changed my entire perspective um, on this school. I just want to thank you guys so much. It's been a lot of great reading. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to draw attention to a point that, that is overlooked here. I am a, formerly an assistant principal and principal in, at Vaux Middle School and at Mead Elementary School. Go back to the 1990s in the 19121 zone. And it, Reverend Renee's question about, uh, to Julie and Isaiah about, are you aware of other students that have your story? It's, it's their story is not an unusual story, and I can speak to that as being a long-term principal. As an elementary school with, say, 60 children entering in first grade, by the time that class reached eighth grade, four of the original children were left. This, this is the kind of transience that was taking place in the neighborhood, and there were three, four different kinds of housing that existed. PHA was probably the most predominant housing source. Next, there was a source of unscrupulous landlords who really, really exploited people with their homes. There was a core, a small core, of families that had lived in the community and had family ownership for a long period of time, but not many. And then there, was a, there were quite a few shelters. 
and shelters were pretty common in the neighborhood because shelters providers found cheap real estate and moved their shelters into the neighborhood. So you had that going on there. I, I just want to put that in as background. Over the course of time from the early 90s up until, say, around 2005, there was an amazing transformation in the neighborhood and over a thousand houses were built for home ownership. They were substitute, they were, people paid something like 50,000 for a $150,000 house and agreed that they would live there for 10 years before they could sell it. But the whole drive of it was to increase African American ownership within the community. A thousand homes, that's a lot of homes. When that economic development really came to full fruit, then all of a sudden, over the last, I would say, five to six years, you have seen a tremendous fill-in of vacant lots from New York kinds of real estate speculators who are coming in and primarily throwing up student housing. So you have this tremendous investment in the community in order to promote 